Good afternoon. Welcome to the CDP webinar, COVID-19 Making Effective Rapid Response Grants. This is Sally Ray, Director of Strategic Initiatives at the Center for Disaster Philanthropy. This webinar is provided with generous funding from the UPS Foundation and is co-sponsored by Interaction, National Voluntary Organizations Active in Disasters, the Council on Foundations, the National Center for Family Philanthropy, Grantmakers in Health, Grantmakers in Aging, United Philanthropy Forum, and the Funders Network for Smart Growth and Livable Communities. Some reminders before we get started. This webinar is being recorded. It will be available on our website and YouTube channel shortly after the webinar is complete. All registrants will be sent a link to the recording. You can submit questions at any time using the Q&A box and they will be answered at the end of the panel presentation. If you are on Twitter, please use hashtag CDP for recovery to share the discussion. This webinar is designed to help the funding community continue to gain more information about rapid response funding necessitated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Our discussion will cover ideas for funders to move money faster, understanding the balance between trust and risk, maintaining accountability while processing grants faster, and why partnerships are key for rapid response funding. Worldwide, as of this morning, April 14th, for those who are watching later, there are 1,935,646 cases confirmed, 120,914 deaths, and 465,073 people have recovered. In the United States, there are 582,634 cases confirmed, 23,649 deaths, and 44,319 people have recovered. The current national hotspots are New York City and surrounding counties, New Orleans and nearby parishes, several Georgia counties, and parts of New Jersey. There is also a significant outbreak in the Navajo Nation. CDP has made 13 grants, totaling just over 2.75 million. As an organization focused on recovery, this is very quick for us. As an example, with the Hurricane Harvey Recovery Fund, my first grants were distributed six months after the storm. And my last round of grants were made in November of 2019, over two years after the storm. But this, for this COVID-19 response, we knew we needed to move fast and adapt our processes to get funds into the hands of responders quickly. Now I would like to introduce our guest. Edgar Venezuela is Senior Vice President at the Schott Foundation for Public Education and author of the best-selling book, Decolonizing Wealth. He's also, he also serves as board chair of Native Americans in Philanthropy. Shalini Eden is the Senior Program Director at Urgent Action Fund for Women's Human Rights. She has over 20 years of experience working at the intersections of health, social justice, gender, and human rights. Welcome and thank you to our panel for taking time away from their work to speak with us today. I'd like to begin by asking each panelist to define rapid response. When you think about rapid response and what is its relative time frame, CDP traditionally funds during a recovery phase starting six to 12 months post disaster. But in response to the pandemic, we already have two rounds of grants out the door and are now working on our third round and even our fourth round. Shalini, let's start with you. Thanks so much, Sally. Um, so for Urgent Action Fund, when we started 21 years ago, we really wanted to uh, be able to build a fund that would um, respond to urgent and immediate needs on the ground for women human rights defenders and trans human rights defenders. So for us, it's really a quick infusion of resources at a time where the need is immediate. We try to release funding within one to 10 days of the request coming in, um, and we try to get that money um, uh, to respond to those needs immediately. And so I think for us, it's really being able to be there um, at a time of great need and be, and be able to um, fund at specific needs that are happening in that moment. And Edgar, what do you think? 
So we are quickly learning. Um, we're not uh, at SHOT Foundation, an organization that has been in the rapid response business. We do approve grants on a monthly basis. So, um, and with the work with the Decolonizing Wealth, we've been sort of moving money uh, monthly as well. So as we're shifting to this new paradigm to embrace a rapid response um, sort of uh, lens to our work, Couple things come to mind for me. Um, you know, we're really looking to get funding to folks in two weeks or less, so that um, being immediate is is very critical. And of course, that means relaxing a lot of uh, the criteria or the due diligence kind of process that we typically have in place. I think it also means to be responsive, um, and by responsive, I mean responsive to the community and quickly understanding and, and listening and hearing from community um, so that we're driving resources directly to, to meet the needs, their needs and not our needs. And the last thing I would say is that it's absolutely grounded in a trust-based approach, um, having relationships in place already so that we're able to uh, kind of skip ahead and fast forward and move at the speed of trust um, is, is something that has definitely been a part, uh, a value in, in both of the rapid response funds that we're running. Thank you both. Shalini, I'm going to turn to you first to give us some more insights. In your work at Urgent Action Fund, you, you're always doing rapid response grants. Can you tell us what you would normally do and how that has changed in terms of COVID-19 grant making? Sure. Um, so Urgent Action Fund is actually part of a global consortium of sister funds which span across the globe. And we're four autonomous organizations who share a model of rapid response funding with a feminist lens. And our Urgent Action Fund provides two kinds of grants, uh, safety and security grants, and then opportunity grants. And all of our grants are up to $8,000. We fund work that is women-led, gender non-conforming led, or trans-led work. Um, our safety and security grants can cover things like evacuation, security cameras, legal support. When an activist or an organization is facing some kind of threat because of the work that they're doing or because of who they are in the community where they work. Our opportunity grants um, are really for moments where activists and movements can respond quickly to a situation in their country or their community that impacts women's rights, trans rights, um, and so they need a quick surge of money to be able to mobilize quickly their community to respond to that. We fund in the United States, in Canada, in Europe, Central Asia, the Middle East, and the North and South Caucasus. And since COVID, um, we started funding more frequently. We've given, as of um, yesterday, in the last three weeks, 23 grants across all of our regions. And that's actually the rate at which we give grants in the, in the span of a month or two. So it's a very high rate of grants that we're giving, and the demand is increasing every day. What we have done are two things. One, we've expanded our criteria and what we will fund. So we've, we have a little bit more of a humanitarian relief response focus now. So we are funding service-based work. We are funding groups who are moving their work to a virtual platform to be able to pay for the hardware or software that they need to do that. We are funding groups who are responding to any kind of human rights abuses that they are finding in relation to COVID-19 that's happening in their community. We've also launched a COVID crisis fund uh, for feminist activists to help raise additional dollars um, for our grants that will go directly to our grant making related to COVID. Uh, and the website is there on the slide in front of you. Um, and so those are some of the things that we've done specifically to um, around COVID and we've gotten very good feedback from all of our partners that it's very helpful. And we are committed to evolving and shifting that criteria as needed um, so that we can continue to be responsive to the partners and the needs on the ground in this time. Shalini, we can, we can certainly see that your timing for RAPID is quite different than ours at CDP. It seems perhaps that RAPID is relative. <laughs> How can funders, especially big mainstream philanthropy, act urgently if they don't have a RAPID response fund program established? Should they create one? 
Yes, I think it's a really good question. Um, I think firstly, the important thing is to think about as a donor, as a funder, what, what are your strengths? Um, and I think if you are considering rapid response grants, I think it's important to do that with existing partners because a lot of what, um, and Edgar referred to this a little bit, is just the, the paperwork and the, that's involved in rapid response funding is you want to, that to be less. And so if you have existing partners, that might be one place to start. I think also it's thinking about how you can use your strengths as a donor to support existing movements and existing efforts. So for example, are there efforts that you can support to public foundations or community foundations or women's funds who oftentimes are playing a very critical role during moments like this. And I think are what we could coin as the front line of philanthropy because they are locally driven, they're very much connected to local grassroots movements and often have the infrastructure to resource quickly to movements. I think it's also important for um, funders and donors, particularly larger ones, to really think about both the long-term and the short-term. I think we're, we're in the middle of a crisis, but it's going to have significant impact five, 10 years down the line. So are there things that donors can think about long-term? Um, now is really not the time to be silent. I think now is the time for donors to be communicating um, often and clearly with their grantee partners to ensure that they know where they stand and how they can be supportive. And I think the final, the final two things that I would say is really supporting your staff. I think all of us are being called in philanthropy at this moment to go above and beyond. And so finding ways to ensure that the staff who are making the grants, who are communicating with the partners on the ground are supported and given the resources that they need to be able to do their job effectively. And finally, I would say thinking about going beyond just the resourcing of work, but also just the practical needs um, that need to be considered, and also considering the trauma, the grief, the loss that comes from a pandemic such as this one, and finding ways to be able to resource communities and movements to respond to that. So if now isn't the time to build a fund, what do you think uh, philanthropy should be doing? How can they support their existing grantees and communities that they work in now? I think this is a moment for philanthropy to really practice solidarity with their partners, um, to be in consistent conversation with them. Um, it's really a moment to listen and to learn and to listen with every part of you about what the needs are. Some of the things that I've heard people do and that we're also doing is adjusting reporting requirements, uh, repurposing existing grants to meet current needs, um, if a grantee has a multi-year um, grant, consider dispersing the funds now as opposed to later. Um, and I think also thinking about some of those technical needs that grantee partners might have in moments like this. For example, um, smaller organizations that have never operated in a, an economy that's going, that's downturning. Um, and so are there, are there resources, are there people that they can help them think about how do you budget in a financial downturn? Um, are there resources that you can provide in terms of doing scenario and contingency planning to help them think through this moment? Um, so I think it's important to be in constant conversation to find out ways that um, philanthropy can be supportive and be in solidarity and partnership with, with communities and movements in this moment. Edgar, let's turn to you. You're supporting two different funds, targeting two different communities that are both doing rapid response funding. They seem to share similar participatory and community-based processes, though. Can you talk to us about these funds and how you're working with other funders to get money to folks on the front line? Absolutely. Uh, so the two models that I will share, um, one um, housed out of the SHOT Foundation for Public Education is a model that was launched from an intermediary public foundation. And then the second fund that I will uh, discuss was one that we launched out of a giving circle um, that um, I, I manage. So I appreciate the opportunity to, to talk about both and kind of the different models. Um, at the SHOT Foundation for, for Public Education, um, SHOT is 
um, an organization that is, we are national and it's a public fund that serves as a bridge between philanthropic partners and advocates to build movements to provide all students with an opportunity, opportunity to learn. So we are a funder that is um, deeply rooted and connected to um, grassroots organizations across the country. We have a, a very intentional lens of race and gender to our work. And because we are a relatively small public funder um, and we do sort of grant making plus where uh, we, you know, we hold convenings, we do trainings for our partners. We do, uh, I, I do think of SHOT as a high touch kind of organization that moves through the world in, the, in a way that is deeply informed by our um, grantee partners to begin with. Um, on the next slide, you can see as the pandemic hit, uh, we immediately began to talk with partners across um, our network to, to see how uh, the pandemic was influencing their work. Now, SHOT uh, funds organizations that are, um, for the most part, movement building organizations. They are coalitions. They are networks. They are advocacy organizations. So they're not uh, traditional in the sense of a nonprofit that might be focused on growing um, organizational you know, development infrastructure, but they're more focused on movement infrastructure, which means that many of these networks um, employ um, organizers and canvassers and, and um, are, are pretty decentralized in how they operate. So immediately we began to hear that organizations were shifting from uh, their advocacy work for a moment to focus on immediate needs uh, because these political homes across the country um, are places where people of color um, convene and gather and have deep trust and it's where they go to for everything. <laughs> And, and so um, our partners were being asked uh, to, for support around food and housing and emergency, emergency assistance um, for thinking through um, how to deal with schools being closed and, and parents all of a sudden having to become teachers and getting access to technology, those types of, of things. Um, beyond the immediate needs, we were also hearing that um, our, our partners, um, because about 80% or so of their work is done through one-on-one -on -one engagement, person-to-person -person engagement, they were having a shift to thinking through how they do their work um, through a, a new digital, uh, th through new digital platforms, online organizing and advocacy work. And so um, what we heard from our partners is that they trusted us to kind of take the lead, but we wanted to do this in solidarity and partnership. So three of our national organizations that we support that you see on the slide, Journey for Justice, uh, the Alliance to Reclaim Our Schools, Dignity in Schools, these are all national coalitions that have affiliates on the local level. So through this partnership, we're touching pretty much every state and um, you know, many, many, many dozens of communities uh, with a built-in infrastructure to get information from the ground and to get resources to the ground. So together, we launched the Loving Cities Rapid Response Fund. Um, and this is uh, a way that we see that we're providing a one-stop shopping opportunity for donors to fund this entire movement. So rather than have many, many response funds, we are working together to fundraise and we're working together to make decisions about where funds should go based on information coming from the ground. Um, we launched a couple weeks ago. We've already made 10 grants and we're moving money as soon as the money is coming in. We're able to get money out the door in two weeks or less. Um, in the next slide, this is just an example of one of the organizations that we supported in Boston, uh, Youth on Board. and beyond sort of the emergency needs that um, organizations are responding to. Um, some of our partners are uh, thinking about how they respond uh, through advocacy in this moment. So Youth on Board, for example, successfully advocated for the city of Boston to continue paying hundreds of young people um, who participate in their paid youth programs for at least three weeks. And those of you in that world understand that these youth jobs are critical, critical sources of income and engagement for young people. Um, they also developed COVID-19 resources for youth, providing bi-weekly virtual support groups for students. And they coordinated um, helping to get food and supplies uh, for young people and their families. What I've heard through SHOT um, and our partners there, but also the other fund, is that young people have a vital role to play in this pandemic and uh, protecting elders and helping to 
uh, deliver um, services. So this is one example of a partner that we supported. Um, in the last slide, um, I'll just uh, share there is the uh, uh, information shot foundation website for more information there. Um, and I think, you know, an intermediary, which I know we'll talk a little bit more about this, um, like Shot Foundation is a great partner where um, there's already an existing ecosystem of relationships and it's really easy to move money rapidly through that, um, through those partnerships. Uh, in the next slide, um, I operate a giving circle through Decolonizing Wealth, um, and I immediately, immediately began to hear um, from organizations led by Native folks, serving Native folks across the country. Um, as the pandemic was hitting our urban centers initially, Native nonprofits in, in New York and Seattle um, were um, kind of being called upon for um, service provisions, and we have a high number of homeless um, relatives and um, folks are insecure um, around food. And so those were some of the immediate needs we were hearing about. I launched this through my giving circle, um, a rapid response fund, and again, through partnership with um, Native Americans Philanthropy um, and the National Urban Indian Family Coalition, we were able to direct support um, already to eight organizations. We'll be sending out um, many more over the next two weeks. Um, this existing network of partners, this ecosystem has its ear already to the ground, knows what the needs are, already um, can sort of vouch for, validate, and quickly skip over due diligence because there are trusted partners at the table making decisions about where funding goes who actually know these people, right, um, and have these relationships. Um, the next slide kind of just shows where um, in the first round of funding, some of the centers across the country where folks are receiving um, uh, medical support, shelter, food. Um, initially, our grants through this fund have been $5,000, and $5,000 goes a long ways. Um, in Seattle, for example, we were told that that money would, would put 20 families into um, temporary shelter in, in a motel in Seattle. Um, and so that's just a profound immediate impacts that we're experiencing by just providing some of that um, emergency funding. Um, so uh, we are beginning as the pandemic has shifted and is now um, hitting our tribal communities. As you said earlier, the Navajo tribe is now a hot spot. We are expanding our support uh, to include uh, um, nonprofits that are supporting and providing response services around Navajo, around New Mexico and the Pueblos where we're already seeing the incidence uh, rates really um, increase and we'll be moving funding there over um, uh, immediately starting this week and over the, the weeks to come. I'll pause there. In our, in our planning and, and in answering the last question, you talked about the importance of, of intermediary funds. At CDP, and I suspect for many funders, it's easy when we have a longer time to connect with organizations to build a personal relationship with our grantees. An intermediary is one step removed from the work. What role can an intermediary play and why is that important at a time like this? I think intermediaries play a, a extremely important role in philanthropy in general, but especially during times of crisis. Um, if you work, if you are a donor or you're, you're working in a foundation that um, has very rigid criteria and requires, you know, um, copious amounts of due diligence, Moving funding through an intermediary that has the capacity to navigate all of that criteria and, and, and due diligence to get money to communities can, can, can often be one way to help you make the case internally at your foundation. Um, we also have the capacity to move smaller dollars, which may be a challenge for a lot of organizations. And I will say, because you know the field is populated now with, with many intermediaries, that not all intermediaries are created equally. And I think intermediaries um, have the opportunity to, um, to, to be a partner for advancing equity. Um, if you are you know, doing your part as a donor or a foundation to partner with an intermediary that may be led by people of color, that may be able to demonstrate that they have authentic relationships and partnerships in communities of color, you know, at SHOT Foundation and also at the work we, we do through our giving circle, 
um, we are, um, you know, already in these communities providing all types of support and there's trust there that has been built over the years that cannot be easily duplicated or um, created in a moment of crisis. And so I think that intermediaries are just a fantastic opportunity to think about equity and making sure that in our haste and in our urgency that we are not overlooking these smaller nonprofits, these organizations that are working on the front lines in communities of color, led by people of color, um, by working with partners who already have those sets of relationships and can get those dollars to the ground um, quickly on your behalf. You talked about trust. It, it seems to me that at a time like this, philanthropy needs to take risks, something we often find a little difficult. Please tell us about the trust risk balance and why now is the time for funders to maybe embrace risk. Yeah, I think I think when we we're thinking about risk in our sector, it does come down to trust. Um, and for some reason, uh, probably systemic racism and, and, and like narratives and myths that have been perpetuated over time um, about communities of color and indigenous folks. Um, philanthropy tends to trust less when we're, we're talking about organizations working in communities of color led by people of color. And so I think we have to just, uh, when we feel, um, when we're, we're bumping up against that tension of this feels risky or this feels uncertain, we have to, need, we need to kind of examine why we're feeling that way and who is the risk for, is it, or who is it about? Um, often it comes down to, I think, issues of power and ownership. If we as funders are not able to give money and kind of control um, how organizations are using that money or kind of uh, enforce in some ways a certain theory of change on these organizations, then we kind of land in a place of this feels risky. But, you know, I think the opportunity in all of this is for us to re-examine some of those notions that we, we tend to have as funders to liberate ourselves from that and to really uh, step into a, a place where we're trusting communities and we're centering humanity and, and communities that are most impacted um, by this pandemic in our work. I think what we just talked about as, as uh, you know, working with intermediaries can be a stepping stone. Um, I'm not encouraging funders to parachute into Indian country <laughs> and, um, you know, um, with bags of money. It, it, it takes, it takes um, you know, uh, time to kind of build um, trust and you know so but look for ways stepping stones to to get there and to uh, examine like our criteria and what we value as funders what information we value who we esteem as experts as we're thinking about trust and um, levels of risk and finding ways to unpack that and deconstruct that um, to move forward in the spirit of trust in these moments is really a, a beautiful thing that's possible Thank you. Um, both of you have talked about your work with vulnerable populations. As we know from the reported statistics, COVID-19 is a disease that is disproportionately affecting different communities, which is embedded in health access, poverty, gender, and race. This appears to be the time for philanthropy to double down on supporting vulnerable populations and at-risk communities. What, what is it important for funders to know about doing this work? Shalini, let's start with you. Um, thank you for that question. I think it's a really important one to be asking at this moment. And I think one thing that's struck me in this moment um, is that so much of what many communities have been fighting for over decades and decades of organizing and mobilizing is coming to light in this moment for everyone, regardless of where you live, regardless of your race, regardless of your economic status. And those are things like disability justice, um, economic justice, healthcare. Um, and I think this is a moment for funders to really think about the long term um, and think about how we can actually live the values that we say, that we put on our website, that we talk about, that we, um, cons we consider is important in how we do our grant making. I think it's important for us as as funders to think about what is the world that we actually want to be creating and living in both within the organizations and institutions that we are part of but also more importantly the the, the movements and the communities that we resource um, i think it's really obvious that many of the systems that we 
um, looked to, or many of us, some of us looked to for support are failing us. Um, and this is an opportunity for philanthropy to think about how to shore up some of those, those systems and, and build up the conversation and the narrative around how do we actually ensure that there is truly economic justice, that there is a healthcare system that supports everyone. Um, and I think using frameworks like disability justice, like healing justice to inf inform the way we think about these things are, is really important. Um, and I think thinking about things like wellness and safety are, are particularly important in this moment as we see so many people suffering um, and losing very basic things in just a matter of days and a matter of hours. Um, so I do think this is an important moment for philanthropy to be thinking both in this actual moment and responding urgently, but also in the long term. Um, and what is philanthropy's role in perpetuating some of, some of these issues that we are fighting against? And Edgar, how would you respond to that? That was a fantastic, beautiful response, and I would second everything that was said. Um, you know, equity matters. Um, it's, it's funny, I've been, um, I get invited in to talk with a lot of funders about DEI and, and racial equity. And um, some funders, because of the pandemic, have said, well, we need to put that work on hold right now and um, focus on, you know, other things that are um, more of a priority, which I, I think is a, a terrible idea. Um, as it was said, I think in this moment, really centering equity, uh, racial equity um, especially, is extremely important. Um, historically, we know that when we look at data on giving and data from philanthropy that only about 8% of philanthropic funding goes to communities of color. And so historically, because philanthropy has marginalized communities of color, we're seeing that uh, the capacity to respond in a crisis um, is, is hindered because of that lack of investment. And so as this pandemic is spreading, um, it seems to be that communities of color um, are hurting the most. And I think there's a significant opportunity for philanthropy to, as I often say, uh, use its money as medicine to drive resources to where the hurt is the most. And that's in communities of color. And, and to think about doing that in a way that um, supports the self-determination of these communities to sort of decide for themselves how they want to respond and take care of communities. And that's uh, extremely um, important to remember in Native American communities where we don't have a history of trust between our communities and the federal government and our communities and philanthropy for, for obvious reasons. Um, but that shouldn't prohibit us from trying to fund if we can um, connect and partner with folks who can um, help navigate that terrain of, of relationships. And I just want to underscore again, I think the, the big opportunity here in terms of equity um, uh, is thinking about the long term. We are in this situation now where systems are collapsing and uh, inequalities are being ex exposed uh, in such a real way um, because of historically very intentional policies and practices that have oppressed uh, communities of color. And so the opportunity here is to think about how do we not only respond in this moment and move this direct emergency assistance to communities who are suffering and to provide that relief, but um, in the long-term game, how do we reorganize ourselves to invest in um, you know, the, the policy opportunities that are going to um, address inequality in the United States and beyond? Um, that would put us in a much better position for the next um, pandemic. Thank you both for your responses. Um, and now we're going to shift to um, audience Q&A. And we have several questions that have been submitted and some that were submitted previously uh, before the webinar began. Um, we have two similar questions from Sam Samantha and Dorothy. Um, they want to know what are the most important pieces of information you're requesting from applicants? Have you changed uh, your applicant process? Um, and are you asking specific questions about how applicants are using the funds? Um, and some of the, they wanna know some of the key pieces of information you're asking your applicants to submit 
before uh, to, to get the grant and then in post grant reporting. Edgar, let's start with you. Sure, I'll be really brief. I think one, um, we are not inviting folks to apply through a competitive process. Everyone that's been invited will be funded. So that takes out all of the anxiety of, of feeling competitive about it and kind of pushing back on a scarcity mindset. We've created a very, very simple application. At the Shot Foundation, if you're a current grantee, there's nothing that you have to do. We do a very brief phone call um, to just sort of um, hear just a little bit about what's happening on the ground and how these funds will be used. And then we put that into our grant making system um, ourselves. If they are a new organization, then we do have a very simple, literally five minute application process that is like, what is your EIN number so that we can move the money? And then um, at, we ask for two to three sentences about how the money, um, um, how you are responding. For us as an organization that fundraises and has to have some level of accountability toward our donors, um, we're, we do wanna kind of have that level of information so that we can come back and tell the stories of, of what's happening um, so that we can keep raising money. So um, for the Native Fund, same process, it's um, invite only so that everyone who um, we, we get in, we're trying to fund. And um, we have a survey monkey that's literally five questions, a very similar type of process. Shalini, do you have anything you'd like to add that you're doing? Um, yeah, I would just, we have a very similar process and, and appreciate following the sort of simple application process as well. Um, the one thing I would add is that we work with advisors who are people in the regions where we work who are connected in some way to feminist movements or women's rights movements or LGBTIQ movements that can help us with the verification of the application um, because we are a 365 days a week funder where we don't have funding timelines, we're constantly funding. So we are asking our advisors um, for additional information so that we're not burdening the um, grantee partner with some of those questions. But we like to keep things as simple as possible and we are constantly evolving our applications and our final report templates to ensure that they are not complicated. And I can answer that for the CDP COVID-19 response fund. We have um, simplified our process. It is invitation only. Um, and we started with organizations that we have a relationship with and we've known. We've utilized our pre, uh, CDP pre-check process, which um, has already uh, done the due diligence process for us um, in order to idea, identify initially those organizations we'd like to support. Um, and we've held quick conversations with, with several of, of our grantees and potential grantees, and then um, have asked them to submit very um, simple two to three page uh, narratives with a budget to explain what they're gonna use for uh, the funding for. So that was our effort to try to make it simpler for them and for us in our approval process. So um, again, invitation only in order to eliminate um, the, the stress, like Edgar said, of, of wondering if you'll be funded or, or being in a competitive process. Um, the next question, Edgar, I think it's for you. It, it's from Holly. Holly says, I work with 17 tribes in my role and I am associated with some agencies who want to provide funding to tribes here in Northern Arizona. However, the agencies are not able to, direct pri to directly provide funding to the tribe but need to provide the funding to a nonprofit entity. Do you have recommendations or experience in assisting with some of these types of challenges? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, there, uh, most foundations actually can fund tribes like there that's that's been a, a myth that we've been pushing back on for a long time that if you that tribes actually do have a um a, a federal designation that allows um, funding to go to them in, in the same way that a nonprofit does so it's a little bit of an extra work on the part of a foundation so many are not willing to do it um, so there is, uh, so what I would suggest is kind of going back to the conversation of an intermediary who uh, knows how to navigate that space and get funding to tribes and tribal nonprofits. So 
um, Holly, feel free to reach out to me directly and I'll, I'll try to support you offline to understand who might be the best partner and, and getting those resources to the tribes. And we have another question about um, our processes here. It's asking if we're moving all our resources as quickly as possible right now, or if we're reserving some for the medium term, still Corona related. And I know we've, we've all, you've, you've both mentioned a little bit of your strategy here. And I can say for CDP, we always focus on mid to long term recovery. This is really a unique process for us in this rapid response model. Um, and as a mid to long term recovery funder, with that focus on the full grant uh, disaster cycle, we will certainly have some funds available for that long term recovery. Um, process to make sure that, that the needs that, that are identified long term are met as much as possible with our funding. It's definitely an area of interest for us. Um, Shalini, would you do you have any more to, anything more to add for you? Um, what I would just add is that um, this situation has, this pandemic has got um, many of us at Urgent Action Fund thinking about is there something that we can do longer term? We are just a short term rapid response funder, but as we think about the impact of um, the, this pandemic in terms of the economic recession on many of the partners that we support, uh, we are sort of in very early conversations about thinking about what what does it mean for us as a feminist funder, as a rapid response funder, as someone in strong solidarity and commitment to the movements that we support? Do we need to be shifting anything? Um, and I think that's further down the line, but going into this pandemic, many of the organizations and the activists and movements we supported were already under-resourced. Um, and I think the impact down the line, six months, a year, five, three to five years down the line will be even more significant. And so it's something for us to consider, not a decision, but definitely something that we are sort of thinking about and um, discussing internally. Kendra, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I, we're still thinking, I think I'm holding that question too. I, we we <coughs> are a funder at SHOT Foundation that makes long-term commitments. Many of our funders, we uh, partners, we've been funding for 10 years or longer. And um, so I am deeply concerned about their long-term sustainability. Um, but every dollar that we have for grant making at this moment, we are putting into this rapid response. Um, just because we know it's sort of now or never, and um, these groups um, are dramatically being impacted, and we we want to see them sustained and uh, thriving through this this crisis, um, and in good faith that we will be able to, wealth will be here tomorrow, and we will raise money <laughs> then, uh, and um, hopefully there will be um, folks who are still being generous to support when we get to that place. So it's kind of a both and I'm holding that, but we are deploying um, all of our resources in this moment to respond. One of the previous, one of the, the questions that was asked previous to, to the um, webinar was how we can turn the disaster into positive social change. Recovery in general is great, and during a domestic disaster, we often hear about building back better. What do we think that looks like for our world after this crisis is over, or at least controlled? Shalini, let's start with you. Um, that's such a beautiful question, actually. Um, and I think the one thing that that is really been sitting with me is that this is not just a US domestic disaster, that it really is global. And I think there's an opportunity there for us to really truly build global solidarity and realize how, um, how much we actually have in common with parts of the world that we assume are very different from us. Um, I think, like I said earlier, I do think that this is really an opportunity for us to, to be bold. Uh, and to be visionary and to push through the demands that so many communities have been fighting for decades for. Um, the disability justice movement has been fighting for access for years and decades, and now we're all 
dealing with issues around access because we can't leave our homes. Um, I think that's important for us to be thinking about, not just that we're sheltered in place and we can't leave, but what does that mean for us and for those of people who haven't had that even prior to um, COVID? I think shelter in place is a luxury. Um, many people don't even have homes to go to and to be able to shelter in place. So my hope is that this, this pandemic will force us to think outside of our own comforts and outside of our own privileges um, and that philanthropy will take that and use that as a way of thinking about how we resource movements and how we think about how philanthropy is structured um, and what can we shift and change in the way that we actually practice philanthropy so that we're actually meeting the needs and living out the values that we talk about um, so intensely. Andrew, do you have anything to add to that too? Uh, that was, it's a beautiful question. That was an absolutely beautiful response. Um, I, I do believe that a, new, that a new world is possible and I believe that a new philanthropy is possible. Um, in this time, I don't know, I've, I've been just, my own coping mechanism through all of this is really continuing, continuing to center humanity and um, the inspiring stories that I see and the people that I know that are um, really being lifted up as heroes in this moment, um, the unseen workers that we have not valued and appreciated in the past. And um, so I, I hope that um, along the same lines that we have a shift in our priorities and what we uh, esteem to be important in life and um, begin to see people more as people I think somewhere along the way in this sector of philanthropy, we have become so institutionalized and wrapped up in our need to be legitimate in some ways that we have lost um, the relationship components of our work, um, even within our own institutions and across the field, but absolutely with, with um, those in community on the front lines of, of doing the work. So I hope that we all return to um, a place, uh, ret return to work or whatever that may be in the future with a sense of gratitude and appreciation for each other um, and a, a deep appreciation and value uh, for the land. And um, that really transforms us to think, rethink how we show up as uh, leaders in community and as, as partners in philanthropy. Um, that's been like really refreshing to see in this response effort how quickly some of the things we've been advocating for for so long um, in this sector have quickly been adapted. And so if these philanthropic practices work in this moment, um, if some of the policies that we've been discussing around uh, a universal right to health care and for family medical leave and all of these I ideas that have seemed far off or maybe unattainable seem possible and right in this moment, then they can be right, um, the right decisions for us um, on the other side of uh, this pandemic. So that gives me hope. I really, I think we can all step into um, a new way of showing up in, in, in philanthropy um, to support communities differently. And I have one last question here, and this is one that I know um, has us thinking at CDP. What tools or strategies, if any, are the speakers and their organiza organizations using to sustain their own resilience? What practices might leadership teams and staff adopt to ensure their own well-being over the long term in this pandemic? Edgar, what do you think? Uh, that's a great question, and um, you've prompted me to understand that I need to do more. Um, and I, I think, especially for people of color, uh, well, I don't want to speak for all people of color, but I know for me and several friends that I've talked to, um, in these times, we we just feel the need to work even harder. And you know, our, we have personal relationships on the line, and people in communities. You know, I have family in New Mexico and in places where entire tribes could potentially be wiped out. So I feel the need to work 24 hours a day. Um, but I know that that's not sustainable. So um, I am in my, my personal practice um, really um, returning to prayer and meditation and I have sage right here on my desk and essential oils 
and I'm just checking up on people. Um, I'm trying to let business as usual slide in some ways, like with just unnecessary staff meetings and all of that. Like, you know, work must go on, but we also have to be sensitive to what people are holding and also see our coworkers as, as parents and as relatives. And you just never know how this pandemic might be influencing people. So giving folks the, the, the space they need to take care of themselves um, is just what I'm really trying to be open to and not projecting my, um, my inability to find work-life balance um, on others. And I am committing to, to do better myself because I know that has an uh, impact on the culture of the organizations I'm a part of. Shalini, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, just a few things and, and just to, to echo um, Edgar's struggle with trying to find balance. Like, I think that's very real. I, I feel that even though there's no commute and you're working from home, uh, the work and the pace of the work seems to have intensified in the last three weeks. Um, and I do think that the amount of time that we spend in front of our computers or on the phone or on calls has tripled. Um, and I think it's important for us to be considering that. So just to, to stand in solidarity with Edgar on that, I, I completely understand that and, and am experiencing that myself. Um, at Urgent Action Fund, we've done a couple things just institutionally, um, reminding folks of the kinds of resources that are available for themselves, for their families, um, in terms of supporting their ability to work, um, if they need to take time off, using some of the guidelines that have come down um, from the federal government around uh, additional sick leave related to COVID-19 matters. Um, and that's been really helpful, particularly for parents who are now homeschooling and trying to work. Um, also really trying to make sure that there is open space for people to check in on a regular basis, optional of course. Um, and I think that's been helpful for folks to be able to connect because we're not physically in the same place at this time. Um, and I think what, what's really important is just the messaging and particularly from leaders within, within organizations is that this is not a sprint. We're really in a marathon and so it's really important to just find ways to maintain. Um, and I know I've made sure that my team knows that if they need to take time, they should just take it. Um, if they need to adjust their, their schedule, they should just do that. Um, and that it doesn't need to be a long drawn out process, but like we're gonna be in this moment for a while. Um, so I think that's important. And all of the tools that Edgar uh, mentioned, I completely agree with. Um, and I think this is also a moment to be in our bodies and whatever that means to us, whether that's resting or doing some sort of physical activity or being outside. I think, um, I, I feel like the universe is calling us to do that, um, to step away from some of the electronic and be more in touch with ourselves, with the, the world around us. Um, and so I think it's really important for us to be doing that as well. And also just staying in touch with people. Thank you both. We're about to wrap the webinar, but before we end, I wanted to ask each of you one final question, and, and parts of it have already been answered. As my colleagues and I have talked to funders and to NGOs, the theme has repeatedly emerged. Life is not likely to be the same on the other side of COVID-19. If this is the time for philanthropy to envision the new world that will emerge, give me 15 seconds on what they should be thinking about. Edgar? Oh, wow. Um, you know, I, I think I would say that we need to start at the personal level. How can we personally be transformed in this moment? Because ultimately, philanthropy is just a bunch of people that work. <laughs> we all, you know, we're people. And if we can shift our own um, view of the world and how we're showing up within our families, within our neighborhoods, then I think that we can have a different analysis that we're bringing uh, into our leadership in this sector. And so in this moment, um, what I'm asking folks to do is to just dig deep spiritually and ask yourself what the universe is trying to teach you about this moment that's, that's, that's different about um, where is there an opportunity for you to grow and to see the world differently. And um, hopefully that spirit and that awakening will, will find its way into your work and how you move money in the world. Shalini? 
Yeah, I would echo everything that Edgar said. And I would also just add to, to take a risk, to don't not think of it as a risk, but to really think of it as really being in touch with what we truly want and vision for ourselves, our community, our families, and the world that we want. And to use our, our position in philanthropy to push that forward. I think I might have been on mute there. So thank you both for your inspiration. I'd like to summarize some of the discussion and provide the audience with some key takeaways from our conversation today. Be flexible, adjust your deadlines, applications, reporting procedures and expectations. Use intermediaries to flow funds to the frontline response activity. Communities of color and other justice seeking groups are often ignored. This disease is impacting them differently and philanthropy needs to respond. Don't reinvent the wheel. Share your resources with those who are experts at moving money quickly, but might not have the funds to do so. And to that end, be a partner with your grantees, with fellow funders, with your community. As our panelists have shared, there will be ongoing needs to assist with recovery efforts over an uncertain length of time. CDP and its partners at Candid are tracking philanthropic donations to this outbreak. As of April 13th, the total donations received stood at $6.8 billion. CDP has many resources, including our COVID-19 response fund, devoted to disaster philanthropy that can assist you, and our staff is always available to provide guidance. You can find more information about our work at disasterphilanthropy.org. And to those of you who may be planning disaster response funding, CDP has additional information in our Disaster Philanthropy Playbook. You can find this resource at disasterplaybook.org. This webinar is first in the series of seven webinars taking place over the next three months on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month at 2 p.m. Eastern. The next webinar will be April 28th, and the topic is COVID-19, Managing Multiple Disasters Amid the Pandemic. In order to respect everyone's time and keep this to an hour, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today's webinar. Thank you so much to Shalini and Edgar for taking time to share their insights. Special thanks again to the UPS Foundation for hosting this webinar and to our co-sponsors, Interaction, National Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster, Council on Foundations, the National Center for Family Philanthropy, Grantmakers in Health, Grantmakers in Aging, United Philanthropy Forum, and the Funders Network for Smart Growth and Livable Communities. And thank you to everyone who joined us. As the webinar ends, a brief survey will pop up. Please take a moment and share your thoughts with us. And if you have questions that were not addressed during today's webinar, and I know I left a few, you may email them to me at sally.ray at disasterphilanthropy.org. Thank you, stay healthy, and have a good afternoon.